the Gospel for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is Luke 13, 22 through 30. He went on his way from one town and village to another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone said to him, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Once the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open for us. He will tell you in reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be gnashing and weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown outside. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And note this, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you set your face to Jerusalem, that though you would there suffer and die our death in our place, you went willingly that you might extend to us the invitation to have our sins forgiven, to be brought into fellowship with you, and to be given the gift of eternal life. We ask now that as we consider the words you spoke, that you will open them to our understanding. Give us faith that we might believe we ask in your precious name. Amen. I wonder, in our world today, if we are particularly concerned about being saved and having eternal life. It would seem that the world around us doesn't really care that we also often live our lives in such a way that it doesn't seem to really make a difference whether our sins are forgiven or not, or whether we have the hope of the eternal kingdom of God. Our readings today, and as we're looking at Luke 13, point us to salvation. The question that was asked Jesus as he was traveling towards Jerusalem was, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And so we're going to take a look at that and hopefully be encouraged to see that being saved is something necessary and that it is something that Jesus has done for us. Luke begins this portion of his account of in the life of Jesus by reminding us that he was traveling from village to village preaching and that he was making his way to Jerusalem. Now as we look at Luke's gospel, we it's pretty obvious that geography is not particularly important to him. As he records Jesus' ministry, he doesn't focus so much on the places as he does on what Jesus does 
as he's traveling from town and village to town and village. But we do have this phrase repeated for us, and it really begins this piece of Luke's Gospel and focuses us into the context of what Jesus is saying here. It's not an accident, I believe, that the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to tell us that Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. And so again, we need to pause and think what that meant. That as we step back into the previous pieces of the account, we will remember that Jesus told his disciples that he was going to Jerusalem where he would suffer and die. It was an odd teaching to them because it was so contrary to their idea of who the Messiah was, of who the Christ was, of who the one God had anointed to be their king was. The suffering and dying just didn't make sense to them. And I suppose we shouldn't be too hard on them about that, because it's really not af until after those events, the suffering and the death, and the resurrection that would follow, and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, that the disciples began to reflect and understand what it all really meant. That the suffering and the death were a suffering and death in our place, a substitution. The fact that Luke tells us that Jesus is going to Jerusalem ought to remind us of our sin. And the fact that the punishment for our sin, just like in any legal system, there, there is a punishment for committing a crime. And our sin is a crime. We are breaking God's law. When we sin, we break God's law. Just like we would break a law in our civil society, and as a consequence, we have to pay a fine or go to jail, that there are, there are consequences for breaking laws. And the consequence for breaking God's law is death. We die. Yes, our world is in decay, and our bodies are in decay, and eventually our bodies will die. But we also die on a spiritual level. That is, that our fellowship with God was destroyed. And we are born, conceived and born, in that state, separated from God, spiritually dead and separated from God. That's the just punishment, we might even say the just reward, for our breaking the law. Jesus was headed to Jerusalem, however, because he didn't want us and doesn't want us to have to suffer that consequence. And so when he died, he did so because he took upon himself our sin. And his death was the fulfillment of the judgment against us. And I believe that Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit wants us to have this in mind as we consider his teaching here that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem to suffer, to die for us in our place so that our sins can be forgiven and so that we can be brought back into fellowship with him. The word the Bible uses for that is reconciliation. That we can be reconciled to God and what scripture promises in that reconciliation is God living in us now and God giving us the gift of being worthy to live with him forever. That after this body dies, 
then there is an eternity, a new life for those who believe, for those, as we will see, who are known by God. We also need to remember that Jesus told his disciples there would be a resurrection, that on the third day he would rise again from the dead. And we recognize that that happens essentially at Jerusalem. It's not in the city itself. It's in the garden outside of the city where he was buried. But there is that resurrection. And again, as we consider that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, we see his suffering and death. And we remember his resurrection because it is through his resurrection that he proves to us that he does indeed have power over sin and over death. And that he can indeed forgive us, reconcile us to himself, and give us the gift of eternal life. We call that salvation. And so then as we continue through our gospel text, we see his response to this question. Lord, are only a few going to be saved? Now apparently, and it's hard to pinpoint exactly, particularly not in Luke chapter 13, but as we look at his whole conversation as he's having with his disciples and he's having with the people as he's traveling again to Jerusalem, He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the return of the Son of Man and being ready for that. And somebody in the crowd, and somebody, one of his listeners, is, is concerned about this. And he asks this question. Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And I would suggest that that is a question that we need to have also, that being saved that having our sins forgiven, that having the promises of reconciliation and eternal life are important to us. And that we need to be aware of how that can happen for us. And so we see two contrasts that Jesus set up then in answer to that question. The first contrast we find is between the imperative strive and the indicative will seek. Okay, so a little bit of grammar here. The imperative means that there is a command. And as Jesus answered the question, he said, strive to enter through the narrow door. And we're going to take a look at that word and see what it means, because I think it means something different than we have in our minds initially. That word, strive, imperative, command, is contrasted to another word, and this is the word, most translations say seek, some say will try, the translation that I've been reading for our gospel text, it says will try. Strive to enter through the narrow door because many will seek or will try to enter and will not be able. So let's look at those two terms. And it's important for us to understand them and to see in them what it is that Jesus is saying about how we can enter the narrow door. He does call it a narrow door. So that, to begin with, tells us that this is not easy in a certain sense. So let's talk about this word strive. The Greek word is the root or the, the word from which we get our English word agonize. That's, it's an interesting kind of twist, right, when we think about striving. It's agonizing, but beyond that, it's struggling, it's a word that's often used in athletic competition to be the winner in an athletic event and what that requires of us or of the athlete. But the 
point is not the doing there as it is the striving or the contending or the agonizing with an adversary against an opponent or even an enemy, if we put this word also into the context of warfare. And what it does for us is helps us recognize that there is an adversary. In our tradition, we have identified the adversary as the world, the devil, and our own flesh. Or the devil, the world, and our own flesh. Whatever order you want to put them there. That the adversary is the devil. And that he is fighting against us and doing everything that he can to keep us from trusting in what Jesus has done for us. And the world. The worldview, the mentality of our society around us would suggest to us that we don't need to listen to God. That maybe there isn't, even isn't a God. And if there is, he's a killjoy. And he doesn't want you to have any fun. And that you ought to just go out and do what feels good to you apart from the boundaries that, you know, some being out there has cruelly given to you. And then certainly we have the self, our old nature, who although the old nature for the believer has been put to death, still strives against us. And so we need to recognize that this battle is there, that the enemy is real, that the world's speaking to us and trying to pull us away is real, that our old nature is there and it's real and it's fighting against us and saying to us, why? Why would you do that? Why would you care? And that's where I think we come back to my original question. Do we want to be saved? Are we concerned about eternal life? the devil in the world would say, did God really say? And so when Jesus says in answer, are only a few going to be saved, he is not telling us to do something because we know that we can't. And we're going to see that with those that are contrasted. But he is reminding us that there is a struggle here and that we need to be aware of the struggle. And then the contrast with the many who will seek or who will try. And again, this is an interesting word. Seek is a good translation. But some other translations that kind of broaden the idea there, search for, desire, require, or, command, or demand. And it's what we see then in this word is the self acting for itself, demanding that God do something, requiring that something, that God do something for me. But the, the implications there is, as this translation says, will try and will not be able. And so the contrast there between those who recognize the reality of the battle, face sin, honestly and truly, or put conditions on God for whatever this is to happen. And then the next contrast that we see further informs what is going on here. And that there is a contrast then in the illustration that Jesus gives about the master who has gotten up and closed the door and then somebody comes and knocks on the door. And I, I, I wonder if this isn't a little bit, again, we've seen that context of the, of the wedding and the wedding guests that come and they're late and the door's already been closed, so they're not allowed to come in. 
And what we see then is a contrast between self-righteousness and being known. Those who come on their own merits and those who are known by the Master. So let's look at the two groups of people that Jesus shows in this little parable. Once the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, remember the narrow door, Lord, open for us. And what is the master's reply? I don't know you. And their reply is, yeah, but we ate and drank in your presence. And there's that self-righteousness. You taught in our streets. It's not the you taught part there. It's the our streets part there. And what we have in the reply of those who come late and find the door already closed is that they are looking at themselves and not being known. Not what they have been given by somebody else. We ate and we drank in your presence. And that is a looking at the self and a declaring that I should be allowed in because I'm worthy because of what I've done, or I should be allowed in because I'm worthy because you came to my streets and talked. My streets, our streets, we ate, we drank. See, it's all about the self. And we see the unrighteousness there, or the self-righteousness there, and the master in the illustration, in the parable, saying, I don't know you. I don't know you. So that then shows us the other side in this contrast. That in order to enter through the narrow door, we need to be known by the master. And Jesus simply tells us here, that people will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And there's an interesting twist here. That the, those who are self-righteous and not known by the Master say they did eat and drink in His presence, and yet it is not they, the self-righteous, who are welcome to whom the door is opened. But it is the foreigner, the stranger, those from the east and the west, the north and the south, who come and notice what they do. They do recline at the table in the kingdom of God. So how then do we tie this all together? Again, we go back to Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. And we need to understand that in the whole context of the Gospel and what it is that Jesus did at Jerusalem for us. Not because we deserve it, not because we ate in His presence, not because we drank in His presence, not because He taught in our streets, but because He has conquered. Because He has won the battle for us. There's nothing that we can demand. There's nothing that we can require of Him. There's no amount of searching that we can do. But humble ourselves and recognize that the battle is real, that the enemy is real, that the old nature would keep us from believing that what Jesus did in Jerusalem, His suffering, His death, and His resurrection, are for us and the invitation to come through the narrow door. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks because in your mercy and grace and love you offered yourself in our place, suffering, dying, that you were raised from the dead to show us your power over sin and death that we might, 
by hearing your word, receive the gift of faith, and then put our trust, believe, that what you did was for us. And that your invitation is to us to put aside our pride, to humble ourselves in repentance, and to recognize that you've won the battle for us. That we might recline at your table in your kingdom. We give you thanks, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.